Well, since I'm in my Luna Lovegood costume, I thought that I would illuminate this passage for you. <clears throat> in Harry Potter and Goblet of Fire, my favorite book. <clears throat> Before Voldemort could stick his snake-like face around the headstone, Harry had stood up. He gripped his wand tightly in his hand, thrust it out in front of him, and threw himself around the headstone, facing Voldemort. Voldemort was ready. As Harry shouted, Expelliarmus! Voldemort cried, Avada Kedavra! A jet of green light issued from Voldemort's wand, just as a jet of red light blasted from Harry's. They met in midair, and suddenly Harry's wand was vibrating as though an electric charge was surging through it. His hand had seized up around it. He couldn't have released it if he wanted to, and a narrow beam of light was now coming, connecting the two wands. Neither red nor green, but bright, deep gold. And Harry, following the beam with his astonished gaze, saw that Voldemort's long white fingers, too, were gripping a wand that was shaking and vibrating. And then nothing could have prepared Harry for this. He felt his feet lift from the ground. He and Voldemort were both being raised into the air, their wands still connected by that thread of shimmering gold light. They were gliding away from the tombstone of Voldemort's father and then came to rest on a patch of ground that was clear and free of graves. The Death Eaters were shouting. They were asking Voldemort for instructions. They were closing in. Um, here, let me see if I can find a illustration. Here's the Death Eaters. So they're in the they're in the graveyard where Voldemort has gotten the magic to bring himself back. And here's all of his. Uh, they're not his friends. They're like <clears throat> his uh, his cronies, his associates with their scary masks. Um, do, 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 do. They were closing in, reforming the circle around Harry and Voldemort, the snake slithering at their heels. That's Voldemort's pet snake and also something that comes up in the seventh book. Some of them drawing their wands. The golden thread connecting Harry and Voldemort splintered. Though the wands remained connected, a thousand more offshoots arced high over Harry and Voldemort, crisscrossing all around them until they were enclosed in a golden dome-shaped web, a cage of light, beyond which the Death Eaters circled like jackals, their cries strangely muffled now. Do nothing, Voldemort shrieked to the Death Eaters, and Harry saw his red eyes wide with astonishment at what was happening. Here is the red... Where's the red eyes? Here they are. Red eyes. So when he came back, he's like only partly a human anymore, and he had slits for a nose, which would be very handy if you didn't want to smell things, I suppose. <clears throat> we played um, Pin the Nose on Voldemort for my birthday, where we had like a pig nose and an elephant nose and a bozo nose and uh and we blindfolded our you know blindfolded each person and you had to like spin around and then put whatever nose you had on Voldemort and it was pretty funny he didn't look as spooky anymore when he had a bozo nose um red eyes wide with astonishment at what was happening saw him fighting to break the thread of light still connecting his wand with harry's Harry held on to his wand more tightly with both hands, and the golden thread remained unbroken. Do nothing unless I command you, Voldemort shouted to the Death Eaters. And then an unearthly and beautiful sound filled the air. It was coming from every thread of the light-spun web vibrating around Harry and Voldemort. It was a sound Harry recognized though he had heard it only once before in life. Phoenix song. I think I have a phoenix. Well, Isaac has a phoenix. Hold on, I'm gonna go see if I can find it. Ta-da, here he is. Here's Fox the phoenix, but it's the cute version. I'll put him right. See if he can sit there for a minute. It was 
the sound of hope to Harry, the most beautiful and welcoming thing he had ever heard in his life. He felt as though the song was inside him instead of just around him. It was the sound he connected with Dumbledore, and it was almost as though a friend was speaking in his ear. Don't break the connection. I know, Harry told the music. I know, I mustn't. But no sooner had he thought it than the thing had become much harder to do. His wand began to vibrate more powerfully than ever, and now the beam between him and Voldemort changed too. It was as though large beads of light were sliding up and down the thread connecting the wands. Harry felt his wand give a shudder under his hand. As the light beads began to slide slowly and steadily his way, the direction of the beam's movement was now towards him from Voldemort, and he felt his wand shudder angrily. As the nearest bead of light moved nearer to Harry's wand tip, the wood beneath his fingers grew so hot he feared it would burst into flame. The closer that bead moved, the harder Harry's wand vibrated. He was sure his wand would not survive contact with it. It felt as though it was about to shatter under his fingers. He concentrated every last particle of his mind upon forcing the bead back towards Voldemort, his ears full of phoenix song, his eyes furious, fixed, or fixated, and slowly, very slowly, the beads quivered to a halt. And then, just as slowly, they began moving the other way. And it was Voldemort's wand that was vibrating extra hard now. Voldemort, who looked astonished and almost fearful. One of the beads of light was quivering inches from the tip of Voldemort's wand. Harry didn't understand why he was doing it. He didn't know what he might achieve, but he now concentrated, as he had never done in his life, on forcing that bead of light right back into Voldemort's wand. And slowly, very slowly, it moved along the golden thread. It trembled for a moment, and then it connected. So here is the picture of Voldemort on his side with his red eyes and his nasty, snaky nose and the bead of light going into his wand. Let's see what happens. At once, Voldemort's wand began to emit echoing screams of pain. Then Voldemort's red eyes widened with shock. A dense, smoky hand flew out of the tip of the wand and vanished. The ghost of the hand he had made Wormtail. More shouts of pain and then something more lar a much larger began to blossom from Voldemort's wand tip. A great grayish something that looked as though it was made out of the solidest, densest smoke. It was a head, now a chest and arms. The torso of Cedric Diggory. If ever Harry might have released his wand from shock, it would have been then. But instinct kept him clutching his wand tightly so that the thread of golden light remained unbroken, even though the thick gray ghost of Cedric Diggory, was it a ghost? It looked so soft. Emerged in its entirety from the end of Voldemort's wand as though it was squeezing itself out of every, out of a very narrow tunnel. And this shade of Cedric stood up and looked up and down the golden thread of light and spoke. Hold on, Harry, it said. Its voice was distant and echoing. Harry looked at Voldemort. His wide red eyes were still shocked. He had no more expected this than Harry had, and very dimly Harry heard the frightened yells of the Death Eaters prowling around the edges of the gold dome. More screams of pain from the wand, and then something else emerged from its tip. The dense shadow of a second head, quickly followed by arms and torso. An old man Harry had once seen in a dream was now pushing himself out of the end of the wand just as Cedric had done. And his ghost, or his shadow, or whatever it was, fell next to Cedric's and surveyed Harry and Voldemort and the golden web and the connected wands with mild surprise, leaning on his walking stick. Hey, you watch a real wizard, then, the old man said. His eyes on Voldemort killed me, that one did. You fight him, boy. But already, 
yet another head was emerging, and this head, gray as a smoky statue, was a woman's. Harry, both arms shaking now as he fought to keep his wand still, saw her drop to the ground and straighten up like the others, staring. The shadow of Bertha Jorkins surveyed the battle before her with eyes wide. Don't let go now, she cried, and her voice echoed like Cedric's as though from very far away. Don't let him get you, Harry. Don't let go. She and the other two shadowy figures began to pace around the inner walls of the Golden Web, while the Death Eaters flitted around the outside of it, and Voldemort's dead victims whispered as they circled the duelers, whispered words of encouragement to Harry, and hissed words Harry couldn't hear to Voldemort. So here is the picture of the Golden Web, and what's happening is is all of the basically the ghosts or the the shadows of the last spells that Voldemort cast with his wand are emerging out in reverse order whenever that beam went into his wand, and so they're sliding out of his wand, but they're not the real people, and they are surrounding Harry and giving him encouragement and protecting him. Here's Harry on his end, fighting to do the right thing and to hold on. And sometimes it's very hard to hold on. Sometimes you just want to give up. And that's when we need our encouragement from everybody around us. And now another head was emerging from the tip of Voldemort's wand, and Harry knew when he saw it who it would be. He knew, as though he had expected it from the moment when Cedric had appeared from the wand. Knew because the woman appearing was the one he'd thought of more than any other tonight. The smoky shadow of a young woman with long hair fell to the ground, as Bertha had done, straightened up and looked at him. And Harry, his arms shaking madly now, looked back into the ghostly face of his mother. Your father's coming, she said quietly. He wants to see you. It will be all right. Hold on. And he came, first his head, then his body, tall and untidy haired like Harry. The smoky, shadowy form of James Potter blossomed from the end of Voldemort's wand, fell to the ground, and straightened like his wife. He walked close to Harry, looking down at him, and he spoke in the same distant, echoing voice as the others, but quietly, so that Voldemort, his face now livid with fear as his victims prowled around him, could not hear. When the connection is broken, we will linger for only moments, but we will give you time. You must get to the port key. It will return you to Hogwarts. Do you understand, Harry? This is James, and he is holding a portrait of him and Lily. There he is. Got untidy hair. Yes, Harry gasped, fighting now to keep a hold on his wand, which was slipping and sliding beneath his fingers. Harry, whispered the, fid the figure of Cedric, take my body back, will you? Take my body back to my parents. I will, said Harry, his face screwed up with the effort of holding the wand. Do it now, whispered his father's voice. Be ready to run. Do it now. Now, Harry yelled. He didn't think he could have held on for another moment anyway. He pulled his wand upward with an almighty wrench, and the golden thread broke, the cage of light vanished, the phoenix song died, but the shadowy figures of Voldemort's victims did not disappear. They were closing in upon Voldemort, shielding Harry from his gaze. And Harry ran as he had never run in his life, knocking two stunned Death Eaters aside as he passed. He zigzagged behind headstones, feeling their curses follow him, hearing them hit the headstones. He was dodging curses and graves, pelting towards Cedric's body, no longer aware of the pain in his leg, his whole being concentrating on what he had to do. Stun him! He heard Voldemort scream. 
ten feet from Cedric, Harry dived behind a marble angel to avoid the jets of red light and saw the tip of its wings shatter as the spells hit it. Gripping his wand more tightly, he dashed out from behind the angel. <clears throat> Impedimenta, he bellowed, pointing his wand wildly over his shoulder at the Death Eaters running at him. From a muffled yell, he thought he had stopped at least one of them. But there was no time to turn and look. He jumped over the cup and dived as he heard more wands, wand blasts behind him. More jets of light flew over his hand or his head as he fell, stretching out his hand to grab Cedric's arm. Stand aside! I will kill him! He is mine! shrieked Voldemort. So this was. This is a picture of Cedric and Harry right before all this happened when they grabbed the port key. That's what they're looking. That's what he's grabbing, the cup. <clears throat> Harry's hand closed on Cedric's wrist. One tombstone stood between him and Voldemort, but Cedric was too heavy to carry, and the cup was way out of reach. Voldemort's red eyes flamed in the darkness. Harry saw his mouth curl into a smile, saw him raise his wand. Asio! Harry yelled, pointing his wand at the Triwizard Cup. It flew into the air and soared toward him. Harry caught it by the handle. He heard Voldemort scream of fury at the same moment that he felt a jerk behind his navel. That meant the port key had worked. It was speeding him away in a whirl of wind and color. Cedric along with him, and they were going back. And that is the end of that part of the chapter 34 in Goblet of Fire.